Okay, so today we'll start sieve methods and plan was to actually finish the entire topic today itself, but I could not finish the entire writing. So we'll see how much we can cover and the rest you'll get in another like two, three hours or something. Okay. Because for the next lecture, like the Wednesday lecture, which we are going to come, we are going to see is we'll cover the posets and uh, Mobius functions and their transformations, etc. Okay, so this chapter is ought to be finished in this week itself. All right, so starting with the sieve methods, first of all, the word sieve. So you people have any idea like in English, what does that mean? Yeah. Uh, no, ma'am, not. Okay, so uh, how many of you drink tea or coffee? Tea especially? Yeah or at least you have seen so at the end once your tea is ready you uh, put it through a siever some people call it uh, to filter the, the uh, to filter the, yes, the powder filter out the solid thing so that you get just the liquid which you drink right so that chalni sort of a thing or the thing the mesh kind of a thing is called the sieve and now sieve methods then by name now you can figure out is the method when you try to sieve things out so that <clears throat> just how even in the tea you put a lot of things like ginger or clove and whatever people prefer cardamom tea, some masala, something, something. Some people put some sort of uh, a lemongrass, I think. And then they sieve it out. So they take their effect and once it has done its job, you sieve it out. Okay. So that is the main purpose of sieving. So you just how, so for the South Indians particularly, or maybe I should not say that, how curry leaves are used in any of the dishes? Most of the people don't eat curry leaves. Curry leaves are put in curries or uh, chutneys or whatever just for the flavor. You put them, the curry leaf has done its magic. It gives the aroma, it gives that very sweet sort of a taste and then you throw it out at the time of eating. So that is another kind of a sieving. So what in effect it means is that there are few things which together come up, but there is something which you want to find at the end. So like in tea, as we mentioned, so final product tea which you drink is the thing which you want. But then that thing you want with a lot of flavors, correct? So those flavors are added through these different, different ingredients. And then once these ingredients have done their job, you carefully keep on sieving them out till you get the final product. So in mathematical languages, language, what you really want is that you start with something which is an approximation to your answer so this is applicable to counting problems mostly or at least that is what we will see here so when you start for the counting problem you may say oh there are approximately 100 goods and then you count almost half of them and you see that the count has reached just 30 you would change your answer to saying that uh, possibly there are at most 60 of them. Just a second. We can't see the uh, lecture. 
Dude, we are seeing your uh, WhatsApp. Okay, so Nirankush was messaging. Maybe he messaged you guys also? I don't know. Okay. Oh, my entire desktop is on share. Oh, damn. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, for the correct answer, you start with an approximation and then you slowly keep on cancelling out things which you feel are then overcount. So, when you do this cancelling out, you have to, st you generally start with an, uh, like, you know, overestimate and then you subtract some things out and then you would feel that, oh, you have subtracted more. So you would add something more and then you subtract again. Just how you try to find the uh, number of elements in the finite intersection of sets. People remember the formula? Uh, yes, ma'am. So that is also a so for example method. So here in this chapter, we are going to see two variants of the sieving method. One is the inclusion exclusion, where you start with an overcount and then you keep on subtracting the overcount approximation to reach a better answer. And then you think that there is an error. So you would add something to get a better answer and so on till you have actually converged to the correct answer. And the next in, uh, variant of the sieve methods will come in the involutions and determinants, which is the part which I feel I may not be able to cover through the live video right now, but uh, we'll see it. So here what happens is elements of the larger set are weighted in a combinatorial way. And then the unwanted elements, that means the extra elements, they gets canceled out. Okay. And in this process, the only the correct answer is left. All right. So as I've already told you, these variations are used to determine cardinality of a set. So let's start with this first variation which is the inclusion exclusion principle all right so okay. abstractly what this principle of inclusion exclusion which i have abbreviated as pi what it says is that it's actually same as computing inverse of a certain matrix which we will see but before that, there is a lot of machinery and a lot of uh, maybe we should say notations which are involved and some theory goes in. So let's go through it slowly. First of all, what this is formally, it says that if S is a set and V is the two dimensional, two raised to n dimensional vector space of the functions from two raised to S to K, where K is some field, okay. So given this data, if phi from V to V is a linear transformation, so every linear transformation is invertible. Is that correct? Okay, let me proceed. I have very little <laughs> patience today. What? Uh, so, uh, yes, has cardinality and is it like? Sorry? Uh, the cardinality of S is N, is it? Yes, the cardinality of S. of S is N. Okay. So, what we do is we consider a linear transformation and what which is defined by that phi of f of t is given by the summation f of y where y is 
like say y is running over all those uh, sets which contains the set t so under this what principle of inclusion exclusion says is that phi inverse that means the inverse of this linear transformation it exists and furthermore it is given by phi inverse of ft so you compare the two equations now phi inverse of ft is the summation which would run over the y's which contains t and you summing over the fy but now with alternating sign and this alternating sign is recorded in what manner in the cardinality of the different set okay so this is set difference y minus t as a set when you do set minus the cardinality of that set okay so there is exactly one set which contains t and has the cardinality t right yes which is that set so uh, um here like uh, you're considering v to be all those uh, uh, like yeah collection of all the function functions right or from the power set to k from the power set to k so v is the collection of all these functions okay. and then this forms a vector space with these functions now i'm defining a linear transformation from this vector space to itself in this fashion and uh, okay what this theorem tells me is that okay ma'am so you see in this format it does not look at all like what it whatever i explained to you right now in the sense of you start with something extra you keep on deleting some things then something extra has gotten deleted so you add back something more and then you keep on doing this till you have reached the final answer so this format does not look like that at all as of now correct but if you gaze more into it what is it really doing it so the first set which we just said that so there is exactly one set which has cardinality same as t and it contains t which is that set t t itself now if you take any other set which contains t and is smaller in some sense what would it look like so certainly any set which has this property has to look like t union something right to t union let's say some other yes. set k k is a field okay t union b right there b is some other subset of s so this is how this is uh, this y is going to look like so the only element or the smallest possible y which i can hit here is the one when your b is empty set correct and then so that is the largest possible approximation you started with then you took because there you will have this cardinality as 0 and minus 1 raised to 0 does not change anything then you start with the elements which have a just one element extra from t so in this case b has cardinality just more uh, b has cardinality 1 right y is equal to t union b correct and there will be many such b's so if let's say s is 1 2 3 4 5 and t is 1 2 then 1 2 3 1 2 4 1 2 5 there are three such choices for this kind of y therefore there are three possible b's b equal to 3 b equal to 4 b equal to 5 correct and for all those three you will have to consider this thing so you would have started with the f of t and then you would subtract your 
f of t union 3 you would also subtract f of t union 4 also subtract f of t union 5 and then you will add back f of t union 3 comma 4 f of t union 3 comma 5 and f of t union 4 comma 5 and then again you would subtract f of t union 3 comma 4 comma 5 correct you people following me yes ma'am yeah so so far with me yes so now when you actually try to see this y containing t in this sense you now you can relate what we said here makes sense sorry here that you start <clears throat> that you start with the uh, with an over count okay as an approximation to the answer and you then subtract off the over counted approximation of the original error then you add on the uh, like sir the what is it called the lesser part in the approximation and then you again subtract off the over counted and so on okay So this at least now makes sense in the terms of PIE, the principle of inclusion and exclusion. We will see more for this. So let's start building the machinery so that then we can actually get our hands dirty in the calculations. So if you, uh, so there is just a lot of notations right now. So if you want, you can, uh, you know, ask me to go slow or if I go fast, you stop me in between and I should repeat again. If A, you choose as the set of objects and S is a set of properties that the elements of this particular set may or may not satisfy. Okay. So it's like in my class, there are three students, you both and Ridhiman. Okay. And you three will have some set of properties. So I give a set of properties to be, let's say, uh, obedient or a listener or a um, good explainer or a footballer. So it is quite possible that none of you plays a football, but that is just a set of properties for me. So A is a set of objects, let's say the element like students of the class and s is a set of properties elements of a may or may not satisfy these properties but s is some fixed set of properties now if you take any subset of the properties you define f equal to t so this is in the subscript it may not look like so but this is a f subscript equal to of t what is this? This is defined as the number of elements of A which satisfies the property T and satisfies exactly the property T. Nothing more, nothing less. Clear? Yes. So if I say that A is satisfying the property T, if A is giving a count to F equal to T, then if TC, this TC, the superscript C denotes the complement of T in S, then A cannot give me a count in F equal to of TC. Yes. Okay. So this set, if I have named, let's say as AT, AT is the collection of those elements of A which satisfies the property exactly T. All right? Yes. So under this scenario, what I know is that some element will belong to AT if and only if it does not belong to A T complement. All right? I am not just saying that A satisfies T. 
I am saying A satisfies exactly T. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay. Uh, yes, no. Yeah. So, uh, moving forward with this, if you would have to define weighted sum. So, this was the sum of the properties in some sense you were counting. If you have to define the weighted sum for that, you will first need to have a weight on the elements. And what are the elements? Elements are sitting in the set A. So, define this element and that is why we started with some field K or an abelian group does not matter as long as we are able to do the addition, etc., where the weight can make sense, right? So the weight is a function on A, then the F equal to T. Now this function takes the form summation WX where X is in AT, which means X satisfies exactly T, exactly the properties that are in T. All right. With this notation, F equal to T, which I defined here, we can analogously define F greater than equal to T. Yes, ma'am. One thing, ma'am, uh, uh -huh. in, in that statement, like X belongs to AT, if and only if X does not belong to AT complement. Right. Like, if X is not an AT complement, then uh -huh. X may not satisfy. Uh, like it means x does not satisfy uh, x does not satisfy at least one property of t complement right right but it does not guarantee that x will satisfy all the properties of t uh, i think only one way like direction uh did i make a mistake like okay. for example so, if yeah, x yeah, is yeah, AT, yeah you are right then, makes sense so uh, x belongs to at certainly implies that x cannot belong to at complement so uh, there is just the forward uh, implication uh, correct yes yes you're right uh, i should correct this so mm, So it is only this. Okay. So if X belongs to AT, it ensures that X cannot belong to A of T complement. But as you have correctly pointed out, if X does not belong to AT complement, which means X does not satisfy at least one of the <clears throat> properties of T complement, it does not guarantee that X has to satisfy all the properties of T and exactly those. It may so happen that X is failing out on just one property of T complement. That's why it is not there. But that still yes. will not allow X to come in the AT. You're right. Absolutely right. Okay. So, uh, thanks. Um, yes. So, um, how we defined f equal to t? Can we define f greater than equal to t? Like all those elements in a that satisfies t. Yes. Number of those elements which satisfies at least t. Okay, which satisfies at least the properties that are in t. So that is what exactly it is. So f greater than or equal to t is this, the cardinality of a greater than or equal to t, where a greater than or equal to t is what you have already figured out. All right. Now, then this is clear that f of greater than or equal to t is f equal to of y, where y contains t. Correct? Yes. Yeah. This kind of a thing we have seen earlier also sometime. Recall quickly. Uh, yes. Yeah. In that. Uh, yeah, we, we did this that alpha and beta. Right. Those, the descent uh, sets. Yes. So in respect of descent sets, we saw that if alpha n is the number of permutations, such that the descent set is contained in S 
and beta n s was the set of permutations. Sorry, the number of permutations whose descent set was exactly equal to s. Then alpha n was bigger than equal to beta n, and this was the relation between them. Correct? Yeah. Yes. So we'll actually visit the uh, alpha n and beta n in today's lecture also, but later. Before that, let's do some more work. So, once you have this format, now can we compare this with this? So, what does yes. the principle of inclusion exclusion tells me? That this particular function here can be represented in terms of this using this signed format. Okay. So just try to, um, so if you people have pen and paper, it might be better if you write these equations 2.3 and 2.4 somewhere, because we'll keep referring to these. Or maybe otherwise okay. I'll just <laughs> scroll up and down. Okay. Okay. So 2.3 is what you get uh, by the most obvious way that f of greater than equal to of t is going to be the sum over of the all f equals there the summation runs over all the sets which is going to contain the set t. Okay. So that is the most obvious equation and then the principle of inclusion exclusion tells me that this function can be written in terms of this particular function by inclusion and exclusion of the bigger sets. Okay. And all these are numbers. Okay. Don't forget. All these are cardinalities of some sets. So f greater than equal to t was cardinality of this particular set, which satisfies at least the properties in t f equal to t was the cardinality of this set, which is the set of elements satisfying exactly the properties of t and so on. So therefore, the number of objects of A that have none of the properties of S are going to be written in this fashion. Right? So we said, this was yes. when the you were counting the number of elements that have properties exactly equal uh, proper exactly the properties of t when you say you want to see the elements which does not satisfy any of the properties you should choose this set to be empty set correct yes ma'am so uh, uh, can yes. you people give me some fun example of one property which does which is not satisfied by any of the students of my electro course? Students not in CMI, not studying in CMI. No, Saham has, has already reached. Oh, properties uh, that I mean, they are not no, studying in CMI. Students. Oh, great, great, nice. Okay. And then other property should come from other person. Uh, he is not here. Huh? Oh, uh, we are just two now. Okay, no problem. Okay, so. If we want to now analyze, okay, so um, the discussion got interrupted. So f equal to a phi is then you just put your t to be empty here, which means the summation actually runs over all the subsets. Correct? All the y which contains empty set, which means all subsets of S. Isn't that true? So yep. rewriting this side for the t equals empty, you get that this is a summation running over all subsets of S, 
with the sign minus one raised to the cardinality of the set and f greater than equal to y. Right? Yes, ma'am. So this analysis is what we just discussed some time back that if you start with y equal to t in the sum, here you have y greater than equal to t is the first approximation to the answer, right? Here. So you have all those elements, the number of all those elements which satisfy at least t, at least the properties of t. But if you want to find this number, you have to slowly keep on bringing this number down. So first yep. of all, this tells me that f greater than equal to of t is at least as big as f equal to of t. Also, this t is actually in up. Looks like it has gone in the level of greater than equal to less uh, greater than equal to. So this is clearly an overcount. So we then subtract all the f greater than equal to y, where y is one element extra from t. Okay, which is same as saying that you subtract the elements summation f greater than equal to y, y contains t and the difference between these two sets is exactly one to approximate better. And then you put back all these elements which have some of these two coming together. Okay, so t union y1, y2. So you add back all such sets and so on. And therefore the name for such principle is principle of inclusion and exclusion. All right. Yes. No. Now, this principle of inclusion exclusion can be dualized by interchanging the containment signs. So just how so far we have been doing this, when we said y containing t and therefore the f greater than equal to of y, these were the this these were the functions we were dealing with, and therefore this was the kind of uh, entity over which the summation was running. Okay, if you want to dualize this entire concept, and I say that look, I know what f equal to of t is. Now, can you tell me what I should make sense? of when I say f less than equal to y instead of f greater than equal to y. And then once I know what is f less than equal to y, how can I approximate f less than equal to y in terms of f equal to of y? Correct? Those are the ob yes. obvious questions. Uh, yes. So that is what yes. we do next. So the dual form, first of all, for the principle of inclusion exclusion says that if phi tilde of ft, so remember this now is in the sense y is contained in t. The original form was y containing t. You see this? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So in the original form, we had phi of f of t to be defined as summation running over all those sets which contains t. So when you want to dualize, you're going to do this in the reverse manner and say that phi tilde, just to distinguish this from the phi, phi tilde of f t is running over all those subsets which are contained in t. All right. <clears throat> so phi tilde of ft is summation run of fy running over all the y's which are contained in t and then you do this i mean this is how you're defining it on all the elements so if this is how your phi tilde is defined then the principle of inclusion exclusion implies that its inverse exists and is given by phi tilde inverse of ft be summation of, again, thus you get signed elements. So minus one raised to 
okay there is a bracket missing here cardinality of the set t minus y this is also set minus again i should have probably put a slant backslash instead of a slash but you get the idea right so this is cardinality of the t set minus y and you take fy and the summation runs over all the y which is a subset of p okay so just how we defined f greater than equal to t we can define f less than equal to t this is going to be the cardinality of the set a less than equal to t where this set is going to be all the elements of a that have that have property at most that are in t all right yes ma'am okay so we now see that if you want to find the f less than equal to t then this is nothing but the summation running over f equal to of y where y is a subset of t and you collect all these summations right yes ma'am yeah. so you start with elements which have let's say just one property or two properties or three properties you keep on going like that till you have counted all the elements that have properties at most the properties of t all right you run over all the properties uh, all the sets which are a subset of the property set of property set t then by this principle i know i can express this in terms of this correct yes ma'am no. so f equal to of t is summation minus 1 raised to the cardinality of t minus y y subset of t f y all right yes well so we have seen the principle of inclusion and exclusion and we have seen its dual version also so just how we have seen this for the containments there it can be defined for unions and intersections so if you are interested you can read it out read it up from the text but uh, i mean that intersection and union is precisely how you find the you know cardinalities of uh, sets of intersections where you take two sets and take their union and then you would subtract a uh, single single elements and so on okay there is a special case okay. of uh, principle of inclusion exclusion which occurs when you see that this particular function f equal to of two sets matches whenever the elements uh, whenever the sets have the same cardinality okay so regardless of which set of properties you choose as long as the number of properties are same as long as the number of properties are same the functions is the set of elements that have those properties is also same which means it is not really depending on the set properties set of properties but it is depending on the cardinality of the set you see the difference uh, yes. so so we are assuming this right like right. yes yes uh, this is the assumption so this is the assumption when okay. we want to see a special case of principle of inclusion exclusion yeah okay 
Just a second. Okay, so when we know that this cardinality depends only on the cardinality of its intake and not really on the <clears throat> set which is giving the count of this set, we have a special version. So in this case, let's just uh, set f equal to of t to be a n minus i, where i is the cardinality of the set t and f greater than equal to t to be b of i. Okay, so then the equation 2.3, which was that f greater than equal to of t is the summation of f equal to of y, where y contains t. And the equation 2.4, which is the reverse of this by the principle of inclusion exclusion, excuse me, which is that f equal to of t is summation of minus 1 raised to cardinality of y minus t, f greater than equal to y, where summation runs over all the y's that contains t. So these two equations now can be rewritten as this. And what it really says is that, so first we are writing this equation, so f greater than equal to t. So this is b, right? So b of m, what is this m? We'll see within a mo moment. So you have said that the cardinality of t is i. Okay. Yeah. Now, in how many ways can you choose an i element set from a uh, from a m element? M choose i. M choose i. And what is this really? What is this y? Is it a superset of t? Yes. So if you try, so this was choosing i elements from an m element set, and then you keep on, you know, going up in your ladder. If you try to see from top to bottom, what you're really doing is that fixing some y, you are just seeing the difference until t. Like dropping, in the reverse, we would drop off elements. In this process, we are adding elements to t. Dropping, not really in the technical sense of dropping, just looking at it, what it really says is that you are choosing i elements, which is the cardinality of the t, from m many elements, where m is any number between 0 to n. n was the total number of properties. Times f equal to of y, which is the a n minus i. Okay, so as you keep on moving up here, you actually reduce the gap here. In yes. the M and I. Yes. So this is the form which this particular equation takes. When you rewrite it in terms of these uh, parameters. And similarly, when you look at this particular equation, the AM is now written as, now again, you choose M choose I and minus one raised to M is the cardinality you are fixing for Y in your head. I is the cardinality you are fixing for T. So you have minus one raised to M minus I, B of I, because B of I is the uh, number this, and then again, there are I many ways you can choose 
i uh, m choose i many ways you can choose the i from m and you again sum over it okay so okay. these two equations this and this in the main case of so why am i able to do all this thing because i know that the set t is immaterial all that matters is that if the cardinality of t and cardinality of some other set t prime is same then f equal to of t is equal to f equal to of t prime okay this property i have and once yes. you have this property in hand it also tells you that this f greater than equal to of t is also equal to f greater than equal to of t prime because here for every f equal to of y for the same cardinality you, have, you can substitute the other y prime also or for this t you could have substituted your t prime here also okay so because of this i am able to actually replace it by an i here instead of a set cardinality so you see the cardinality of the t i mean it has vanished it i am just starting from 0 up till m yes so in between i have lost the information about the set which i was dealing with all i now care about is that as soon as the two sets of properties have same cardinality their f equal to functions are same and therefore all i have to worry about is their cardinalities okay so we get these yeah. two equations this is 2.9 2.10 i have kept all these equation numbers also same as they are in the book so that if you have to you know go back and read more details from the book you can refer to them as it is you'll not have to sort of sit down and mismatch them okay so if you see that m is a n plus 1 by n plus 1 dimensional matrix with ijth entry given by j choose i so you can sort of sense why j choose i might appear in the picture because i have already come to some expression which have these binomial coefficients right yes yeah. so if m is a n plus 1 cross n plus 1 dimensional matrix and i plus i comma jth entry is j choose i then its inverse matrix m prime will have the ijth entry given by minus 1 raised to j minus i times j choose i so oh, it's i not 1 it's a mistake so this is i okay so um oh. yeah so inverse matrix m prime of this particular m at the ijth location will have the same entry but the sign will come depending on the parity of j minus i okay for example if you consider this particular matrix 1 1 1 1 0 1 2 3 0 then its inverse will have this entry as it is because this is the 1 1th entry so its inverse will have 1 1th entry to be this with a sign minus 1 raised to 1 minus 1 right this is 1 2th entry ij is 1 comma 2 so you will have 2 minus 1 so there is a minus 1 involved here similarly there is no minus here there is a minus here there is a minus here but since it is zero does not show up there is no minus here because it's entry 2 comma 2 
this is 2 comma 3 so 3 minus 2 there is a minus sign and so on you see this right yes now <clears throat> in this particular uh, data if you let your n to reach infinity so here these m's were bounded from above by n right so if you allow n to be if you allow n to approach infinity then the 2.9 and 2.10 which is the am and bm equations here they become equivalent and thus so by equivalent what do you sorry Adlan is back okay so they become uh, equivalent huh i'm sorry man i got disconnected oh you got disconnected okay so so till up till where you could hear me uh uh, the matrices were inverses and then uh, you went to the next equations. Okay, so this inverse you understood? Ah, yes, ma'am. Okay. So, with this, if you, uh, if you let your n tends to infinity here, then these two equal uh, equations become equivalent and what you get is that am can be written as delta m of b0 where what is delta m it is the mth shift operator which means you apply shift operator m times or rather i should say difference operator not the shift operator this is what happens when you make notes in a hurry so this is Difference operator. Oh, great. Okay. So, what does the difference operator really does is that if you take a function f, then once so function f uh, on the natural numbers, then the difference operator records the difference between its next element and the current element. So delta of fn is f of n plus 1 minus fn. This is the difference operator doing on f of n. And then when you apply it m times, you apply the delta on the delta m minus 1 of f of n. Okay. Okay. So um, maybe I'll give an exercise related to this or not. I'm not sure, but we'll see. So far, what is really important is that AM can be written as delta M of B0. Okay. Now we'll see some examples of the principle of inclusion exclusion and the special case which we dealt with in more detail. So first example, the famous example, we have seen this earlier also in our course, the derangement problem. What does that say? That no element should go to itself. Or if you want to put it in the uh, postman problem, you say that no letter be delivered to the correct address. Right? So every letter has a correct address and exactly one correct address and it should it can go anywhere but its correct address okay so <clears throat> here we see this in terms of the permutations of n elements so derangement problem counts the number of permutations w in gn that have no fixed point which means there is no i such that w of i is i the ith location is itself. Okay. Yes. So, 
dn is the number of all such permutations, then we have seen this before also that if you have zero elements, then vacuously you get one way of doing this. For one element, there is no way. So it's zero. For d2, it's exactly one way. There is exactly one permutation of elements one comma two, which has no fixed point, which is two one, right? Yes. So if you interpret W of i equal to i as being the ith property of W, so W i equal to i is the ith property of W. Correct. So then what you're really asking is that you're asking this property to be failed. Isn't that so? Yes. So the number of permutations with at least T properties of N of points fixed is, which is this by definition, F greater than equal to two is the number of permutations which have at least t many fixed points, right? W i equal to i means i is a fixed point, first of all. Yes. So if you take t to be a subset of n, you are saying that it has those many fixed points as the cardinality of t? Yes. So this f greater than equal to t was b n minus i. Remember? Yes. F greater than equal to t of whichever way you put. One side you have to remember. Both are same. Yeah. So this is n minus i factorial. Why? That's because like one way to see this is uh, we have all the remaining permutations, right? Which don't fix this. Uh, we get that group. So, for example, in S three, if you if you just collect all those permutations, fixing one, then that will be uh, S two. That is G two. Right. So let me try again. So that's. Okay. And the cardinality of the set T is I because you're dealing with P n minus I. So then by 2.10, which was the uh, expression for B uh, A M, I think so. Yeah, the expression for A M, just, uh, just try to remember this a little. So M choose I, B I with the weighted sign implies that f equal to of empty. So you want to now count a of n minus n, right? So that no elements are fixed. B of n minus hmm? uh, B or n. So B of N minus N is what B A of zero is. Uh, yes, correct. Correct. I mean, in that yes. sense, they are always in the uh, gap of I. I yes. N minus I. So zero N, gap of N, I should say. So then F equal to of empty, which is the A of N, because B of N minus N would have become zero. So you are actually counting A of N, right? Yes. So this counts the number when no property is satisfied. Correct? This is what we need. This is what we need. So mm -hmm. this AN is the DN. So DN from the equation 2.10, 
turns out to be summation i running from 0 to n and choose i minus 1 raised to n minus i i factorial. Okay. And this can be manipulated and written if you just multiply and divide by n factorial throughout, you're going to get n factorial times 1 minus 1 upon 1 factorial plus 1 upon 2 factorial minus 1 upon 3 factorial and so on. Okay, this is the most common form which you see it in, right? So you see how easily yes. we found the number of derangements using this uh, principle here? Yes, Yes, So now we move on to the proposition which gives the maximum essence for the principle of inclusion exclusion principle uh, principle of inclusion and exclusion in the special case when the uh, count does not really depend on the set of the property but only on the cardinality of that property set okay yes so for each n natural number <coughs> Let B of N be a finite set and SN be an N element set of properties that elements of BN may or may not satisfy. Okay, as before. Earlier we said A is some finite set and S was the set of properties which elements of A may or may not satisfy. Now we just have a BN and an SN. So don't confuse this SN with the set of permutations. It's just SN. Now, suppose for every subset of this property set SN, the number of elements X in BN lacking at most the properties of T depends only on the mod T, the cardinality of T, and not on the set, set or rather uh, the full set SN cardinality of Sn is n. So this is my, my assumption. And then let Bn to be the cardinality of this set and An to be the cardinality of x in Bn so that x has no property in Sn. Then An is delta n of <clears throat> B0. So what happened here? <clears throat> we did, <clears throat> excuse me, second. Sorry. So what happened earlier was we did this entire thing for a restricted case, right? And here we are giving a general formulation that whenever you have a finite set and a set of uh, properties, such that the number of elements that lack at most the properties of T depends only on the cardinality of the set and not on the full uh, cardinality of this property set, then An is the nth difference operator of B0. Okay. Oh, okay. So with this, let's just see an example which I promised earlier. So this is what we had seen earlier that alpha n of s was clearly written to be like this and beta n of s was this. And I said that we will see later why this is true. So at least today I have fulfilled my promise that beta n of s can be written in this fashion. It is equal to this expression by principle of inclusion and exclusion. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Now, to see the rest of it. Okay, so this is actually the coming from the dual version of the principle of inclusion exclusion. 
agree because alpha n of s yes. actually has the information of the elements whose descent set is a subset of s yes so you are approaching from bottom to top okay yes so uh, just to recall quickly beta n was the number of permutations whose descent set was exactly equal to the set s which is in picture for you and alpha n of s was the number of those permutations whose descent set was a subset of s and then we obtained the expression uh, we obtained an expression of each other in terms of each other now we'll do a explicit computation for the exp like expression for this beta n of s and once you know the expression for beta n of s an explicit expression you can use this to find an explicit expression for the alpha n of s correct correct yes so yes. if you write the so uh, these are the elements of your s okay so if elements of s are ordered and you put them in this order so if one is less than or equal to s1 less than s2 and so on till sk less than or equal to n minus 1 then alpha n of s you have seen that this is equal to this you have also proved it in your assignments yes, so yes. using the formula here you know that beta n of s is this summation running over this minus 1 raised to k minus j and the multinomial coefficient n choose s i1 s i2 minus s i1 and so on till n minus s i j all right yes now define a function f from 0 k plus 1 cross 0 k plus 1 to 0 1 such that or um okay so this is a partial definition so um if you see so f of i j i am defining it to be one if i is equal to j so try to see this f of r, f to be defining entries of some matrix okay so you have a k plus two cross k plus two matrix and you are now going to throw in the entries of this matrix so by this i know that the diagonal elements are all one right yes furthermore the, uh, huh? lower diagonal is zero lower di i mean lower uh, entries are zero Diag and lower elements are below zero. the diagonal. absolutely right but we do not know what really happens to the upper diagonal stuff Yes. upper diagonal as an anti-diagonal correct because i have yes. not shown here the values which f of ij should take when i is smaller than j okay so this is really putting entries on this particular diagonal of my matrix and here it is all zero correct this is something which we do not know as of now. Oh, uh, I can't see you right. Uh, the cursor is moving. But oh, why? I can't see. Can you see now? No, ma'am. Uh, it was visible before, but not now. Now, can you see? No, ma'am. This is weird. Can you see now? Oh. I, I can see the screen, not. Uh, I mean, I you can can't see even the see the annotation I... moving on my screen. No, I can see the cursor, but not, nothing is written. Oh, wait, I'll stop sharing it and reshare again. Okay. Is it visible? No. 
Is it visible, Agile? No, ma'am. This is weird. No. Oh. Okay, let me come to the whiteboard. Can you see the whiteboard at least? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So what we are doing is that we are defining entries on a K plus two by K plus two matrix with all diagonal to be one and all the bottom of this to be zero. And these entries, I have not said so far what they should be. Okay. Yes. So this is the scenario as of now. Just remember this and we will see later the missing entries. Okay. Shared screen went. Okay. Uh, is my uh, lecture thing back again on the screen? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. So now if you observe this particular sum, what I have written, the huge sum, so summation runs over all the values of I1, I2, Ij. Okay, strictly increasing order. I1 greater than or equal to one, Ij greater less than or equal to K. Along with signs, and you have F of zero, I1, F of I1, I2, F of Ij, K plus one. So Ij is less than or equal to K. So Ij is strictly less than K plus one. Yes. Zero is strictly less than I1 because I1 is greater than or equal to one. Yes. And I1 is less than I2. Yes. So the terms in this sum are just the non-zero terms in the expansion of K plus one cross K plus one determinant of a certain matrix. So we started with a K plus two cross K plus two matrix. Right? And yes. you have a determinant whose ijth entry is F of i j plus one, where ij is in zero to k, zero to k. Okay? Because are you able okay. to see my annotation now? Yes, ma'am. Ah, great. So in this K plus two by K plus two matrix, which we started off with, all the entries here were known. So in particular, the entry at N comma one was known here. Yes. This was one. Yes. Sorry. <coughs> But uh, oh God, what am I this saying? This diagonal was one. This diagonal. I mean, Sorry? Uh, the other diagonal was one. Yeah, this is one. This all is one. We know. Yes. And all other entries in this section are zero. The lower right. section, right? Uh, I bigger than J, Agilan. So you have A21 to be zero. So A21 is going to appear here, right? I, yeah, so the so lower uh, part. So I am saying on this line, all the line, all the elements above this, which are not one, are zeros. Okay. Oh damn! What am I doing? But this... Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, let me. Oh, the anti-diagonal doesn't come into the picture. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
There is my eraser here. So what I want to say is this. So all this I know is one. All this I know is zero. Correct? Yes. Yes. And here is what I will fill later. Or rather, I should say I am filling it with f of i comma j plus one, i j th entry. So one comma two is filled with one f of one comma three. Okay. So what happens is if you set f of ij to be the reciprocal of sj minus si uh, factorial. So si, sj were the elements of s, remember? And the s which you started off with, its elements are in a total order with S1 being the smallest and SK being the largest. So F of IJ you are setting as one upon SJ minus SI factorial. You choose S of zero to be zero because you have elements only from S1 to SK. So S0 you set to be zero, SK plus one you set to be N. So with these two notations in picture, here you can define f of ij to be entire thing. So why we did that earlier? This definition was to first of all see that in this sort of a fashion when you write something like this it counts just the non-zero terms in the expansion of this determinant. Okay now in the place of non-zero terms I can put the terms which are relevant for me. Correct. Okay. So that is why all this was like sort of a trailer or rather a mini exercise for our brains to figure out what really happens to the entries of this particular sum. What is the relevance of these entries here? And now once you have figured that out, now we put the actual entries which are useful for us. So f of ij you set to be reciprocal of sj minus si factorial, keeping s0 to be 0 and s of k plus 1 to be n. Then beta n of s can be rewritten as n factorial of the determinant 1 upon sj plus 1 minus si. Why this thing? Because you said beta n of this is entire this thing. And then for this particular summation, when you have put this, it's counting just the non-zero terms in the expansion of the determinant of this particular size matrix whose ijf entry is this. So beta n of s turns out to be n factorial times determinant of this matrix whose ijf entry is given by sj plus 1 minus si factorial for ij in the 0 to k 0 to k. So for example, if you take n to be 8 and the set s to be 1 comma 5, then beta 8 of s is going to be n factorial, which is 8 factorial times determinant of this matrix. So if you write this down, the matrix is, I should have written i plus 1. So here j plus 1 is actually i, uh, uh, sj minus si and sj is i plus 1. So it's a typo, maybe you should fix it. So you have okay. 1 upon 1 factorial because you will have 0. Then you have 1 upon 5 minus 0. Right? 
Yes. This is S J minus S I. You're getting my point, no? So when you're standing yes, here, it is I J T entry. So you do one upon S. How did you get zero? Five uh, minus zero. So S one minus S one at this location. S um wait, I think I made a mistake. I I think S must have three elements. Like zero must be there. Yes. No zero is just the S zero, Agilan. This particular thing is the S zero. So oh, when okay, you're okay. standing here, you do the first element minus S zero. When you stand here, you do the second element minus S zero. When you stand here, you do the third element. Third element is what S K plus one, which is the last That's element. Uh... That minus zero. Then this. Is anyway one. This you put S two minus the previous element. This you put. मतलब so let's say. So if this is S one and this is S two, so then you put S two minus S one factorial. This is S three minus S one factorial. What is S three? S three is actually k plus one, so it is n. Therefore, it is eight minus one factorial. This is zero. This is one. And then when you come here, you have S three minus S two factorial. So it's not three; it should have been a five here. I've made another mistake. So many mistakes I've made. Okay. Although okay. eight minus three five factorial and three factorial. Uh, okay, yeah. Here it will make a difference. And then you, when you compute the determinant of this matrix and multiply it by eight factorial, you are going to get the answer to be two hundred and seventeen. So that you can check. Okay, and the next piece which I had to cover was involutions and determinants, but this is not complete, so I will not touch it in this particular video. I'll put another video with this content. It's not so good, otherwise. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Um. Any doubts? Uh, no, ma'am. Basically, in short, um. Okay. This. This sort of um, a small intro would be better for you people to understand when you see the video. So involutions is the next is part of the next variation of the sieving method. Where remember we said that elements of the larger set can be weighted in some combinatorial way, which means what you really do at least in the involutions is that. You start. There is an identity which is given to you, a equation, and when you have to prove this equation, we have done this earlier also. We do what we do is that we take both the sides of this equation, okay, and we try to set up a bijection between them. So if they are counting numbers, we try to interpret their elements as something, and then we set up. A bijection between the sets of these elements. The combinatorial proof how we used to give. So that is how involutions yes. come into picture. So we will, uh, in particular, deal with this. Uh, where is this equation? So this particular equation, if you see here, this f equal to of m t. Is written as a uh, summation and subtraction, summation and subtraction of elements, right? So here, as it is, it is not really counting some uh, sets cardinality. So we will have because here there are some minus signs appearing in the equation, right? So we have to get rid yes. of those. 
So we'll do that. And once you have done that, so how you'll do that? The most obvious way is whatever is uh, coming up here with the negative sign, you transfer those elements here. Right? Okay. So with that interpretation or rather rewriting of the equation, you will have on the left hand side, you will have a full summation with all entries uh, showing up as positive. And on the right hand side, you will have similar thing, which means all there is no negative sign involved. So then it's really giving you some cardinality, some, some set count is there. And then you do interpretations for the both the sides and you set up a bijection between them. And their involution will come into picture where then in the applications, you can have a lot of uh, things which you um, studied for the topic inversion. Okay. Okay. So that will come up in the video. But uh, this one I will end here itself. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Okay, Chala. Yes. Oh, only till here I could finish writing. Some interpretation was there. Okay. Okay, so I'll end the meeting then. Okay, ma'am. Fine. Thank you, ma'am. I'm really sorry. Uh,